Welcome guys, gals, and I'm Binary Pals to this week's episode of Buffy Boys, your weekly review of Buffy the Vampire Slayer from a queer, literary, and feminist perspective. My name is Joel, one of your hosts, and with me as always is your other brainy host. Oh, you didn't think about that, did you? I was going to say, oh, your name's Brian. Say hi, Brian. Hi, Brian. I was going to say bodacious, and then I was like, that didn't sit right with me. No. Um, and then I thought, brongy. And then I was like, well, let's not lie. So, I said I'm brainy. Brainy Brian. Well, that's fair. Okay. Um, hi. Hi. Um, how are you? Good. Um, still partially deaf. That's my own fault. Uh, um, what, how that, what happened? So, I, 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 don't, I don't see how this will be relevant at all to our audio podcast. But it I, happened while we were listening to Bowie. Or watching Buffy. <laughs> it's true, yeah. I basically scratched at my ear with a pen which had a tiny rubber cap or like a this was like a fancy pen so like a little soft tiny rubber ball on the top of it which I cannot find and now I I was spent a period of time last night worried that it was in my ear canal <laughs> and I'm still not 100% convinced it's not but I do I do I do feel maybe psychosomatically that I can hear less out of that ear now and you have picked at your ear I'd say once every 30 seconds since um, I have explained to you that that's not how your canals worked. That does not seem to have made any difference Things to you. Things can though. get lodged inside of your ear. I think I think that's entirely possible. So, um, as you may have guessed, this is a Buffy podcast. We already said that, didn't we? Yeah, we're talking about uh, season five, episode five, uh, which is called, as we all know. Oh, you don't know this? Um, no place like home. No place like home. Yeah, I know that. You know that. The audience knows that. Um, so yeah, how are you, Brian? You do well. Yeah, mostly grand. Um, I feel like I mentally prepared for this podcast like 0%, so, uh, or this episode, um, in terms of like approaching it and remembering that I ha- was going to have to talk. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I could talk about my new headphones, they're nice, but it's like, no, 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 no one wants to hear about my new headphones, even though they're so cool. I'm blue. Yeah, no? it's only the fourth time I've heard that, so. Here is the Buffy and summary for the week. It was directed by David Solomon, who last directed Buffy vs. Dracula. And it was written by Dave, uh, Doug Petrie, who last wrote The Oka Factor, and it was first aired on October 24th, 2000. So, oh, we're actually going to be, like, very close to being exactly 10 years in the future at some point soon. Mm-hmm. It's kind of cool. Well. Yeah. Oh, uh, wait, no. We do an episode of the podcast weekly, and they release an episode weekly, but we release more around Christmas than they would have? We can chase them. It's fine. We'll catch up. Yeah, okay. Anyway. Monks send a mystic key away before being slaughtered by evil, ditzy glory. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, after finding a magic sphere, Buffy suspects evil magic is making Joyce ill and goes into a trance to seek it out. She discovers Dawn is not real. Glory, who, is su- who sucks out people's minds, tortures a monk. Buffy rescues him after fighting the stronger Glory, but he dies. After telling Buffy that Dawn is a key and all her memories are false. All memories of her are false. Buffy decides Dawn, that Dawn is her innocent sister, even so. I'm not sure. That's editorializing quite a bit. That's editorializing, yeah, for sure. Um, so, um, we'll get into all that. I think it's a, it's an odd episode because it's 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 light on theme to some degree, but uh, heavy on plot advancement. Plot necessary, I think, yeah. Yeah, but because I much prefer Glory and the context of Don, Glory, Buffy, Joyce, family, all that shit, um, so much more than the um, industry, what's they're called? The initiative, the initiative, Brian. I much prefer the like week on week advancing the plot episodes in season five than I do in season four. Mm. So anyway, um, for our, for our bronze banter, we on Saturday, because it was Joel's birthday yesterday, oh, really? which oh, really? was Monday. So happy birthday, Joel. Thank you. Um, uh, like what? 35 years old now? Ho, ho, ho. Do you know what age you are? I've been told with reasonable certainty by my family that I'm 29. We were also told with reasonable certainty by your family that you're 30. Yeah, that's true. So, um, happy birthday. But we, Joel got to choose a 100% guilt, like, you know, no questions asked film choice basically which i'd love to do someday i'd love to be able to be like oh we're just going to watch this for an hour and it would be or an hour and a half and it'll be a Mike Lee movie and it'll be three hours long absolutely brian i promise that for your birthday i'm gonna make an enormous deal out of it oh i believe it and we watched uh hellblazer there was there was zero chance you're gonna get that name correct yes clive barker's i want to say 1987 1988 um horror film hellraiser um, which is one of which I've never seen and I've always been fascinated with for a number of reasons. Um, so contrary to my 
you know nerves of steel now and kind of macho personality and all that um i was very 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 easily scared as a child and particularly by horror and horrific thoughts i just it was too real it was all too real to me yeah, so you read the summary of a nightmare on the street and couldn't sleep for a week right yeah on wikipedia yeah, and like i had to keep my door closed it was very worrying because wikipedia was created when you were 15 yeah yeah i'm not saying I, i'm not saying i was a, a child so i'm saying i was you know a younger person um so i don't think i don't think i really watched horror of any description until probably around the time you and i started dating which is like about 23 years ago now um, so anyway, Hellraiser is one of those horror franchises which I've never watched. We've watched the Jasons, we've watched the Michael Myers, we've watched the Freggies and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's kind of fascinating for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that the protagonist, or not the protagonist, but kind of the, the main creature in it is colloquially called by fans Pinhead, very visually distinctive man whose head is full of pins in kind of s and bondage gear, essentially. And there's a lot of uh, Lovecraftian, cosmic horror... Um, a, a puzzle box that you open, etc., and it sucks you into the dimension of eternal pain, etc. Which isn't hell, which isn't specifically as meant to be just like beyond human understanding. Um, and yeah, so I've always I've always wanted to be brave enough to watch it, and we watched it, and it was actually okay. T- t- a couple of things about it. I'm so scarred, like I'm, I'm so full of scar tissue now from all the various things we've watched over the last few years, your Hannibal's and so on. That it actually wasn't that bad. Mm-hmm. Like I certainly wasn't. A horrified fight during it while I could see that this is very gory I can see why this was banned why it was unraged like all this kind of stuff I'm like I'm kind of fine with this because mm-hmm. I'm playing games with these themes there's a certain the- distance as well that time attributes to these things where like it's such escalation where what is actually genuinely visually horrific in 2020 is very different to what was visually horrific in 1987 in terms of what you can actually achieve so yeah and what your imagination can fill in or is being asked to fill in. So our imaginations in current day are on a day-to-day basis in terms of the visual stuff that we watch or asked to um, fill in the blanks less frequently. So we're less practiced in that um, or less um, intrigued by that. Whereas in the 80s, mm-hmm. you're watching a horror movie, um, you see a flash of like someone's face being ripped apart and now we're like, that's rubber, you know? Yeah. And then you were like, oh my God, my brain is melting. My my sister, who is 12 now, had the most like, predictable reaction to my parents had her watch Jaws. And she was like, it's so boring. He doesn't even do anything. You don't see him. You know, I was mm. like, yeah, that's, I, I, I think you can't, you either live with that kind of what's not seeing a scarier life or else you're born now. Yeah. It, it's, it's why like psychological horrors from like the 60s, 70s work really well. So like uh, Don't Look Now or... Um, a lot of Hitchcock, obviously, mm-hmm. or say uh, The Shining, mm-hmm. or, or actually didn't mean to say The Shining, but Shining is a great example, or The Haunting, um, the original Haunting, obviously not the 90s Haunting, mm. um, which you haven't seen, which I must show you, but it's it's incredible. I feel um, like I've seen so many films with variations of the phrase Haunting on Hill House or whatever, or Haunting yeah. or whatever. Um, well, and both that haunting. one we watched for the hug, um, um, Owen Wilson. Owen Wilson, yeah, that's that was, also Haunting, isn't so, it? So, okay. The- <laughs> The we will come back. We will come back to Hellraiser because I want to finish Hellraiser. Haunting of the Highest by Shirley um, Temple. No, Shirley Jackson. Shirley Jackson, who was a fascinating person. I think I've I think I've said this spiel on this podcast before. Fascinating person. Um, really worth reading her Wikipedia page for her biography. But she wrote a couple of horror novels. Um, very very accomplished horror novels. So the Haunting of the Highest is genuinely a great read. I recommend it to. Where's my copy of that? I think I gave it to someone. I think I gave it to Ronan. I'm going to get back at him. Um, and it's genuinely accomplished, very good. And uh, the 1960s adaptation of it, black and white, really stunningly scary and creative and really interesting. Mm-hmm. Very influenced <laughs> by um, the Taming of the Shrew, I would say. And then the 90s adaptation with Catherine Zeta Jones. Is that her name? Catherine Zeta. No, I know her name, but it's not coming. Anyway. Catherine Zeta Jones. And uh, Owen Wilson and Liam Neeson and Lisa from Six Feet Under is the main character. Who's, I don't know her name, actor's name. But they are... There's an adaptation in the 90s. It's like one of the worst horror movies ever made, probably. It's just total it's kind of fucking trash. fascinatingly bad, though, because if anyone's watched... And we probably recommend it at the time if we were doing the podcast at the time, which I think we were... The uh, Netflix adaptation of Haunted House. That Weird. Was, yeah, October 19, or 2018. Weird. Well, it was very good anyway, uh, but it's kind of... 
it not plays straight, but there's a certain craft to the show, whereas this film with Owen Wilson is just batshit American craziness. Yeah, there's no scaring to yeah. it. There, it's just like but the set is like film. the the set is so baroque, and you know, as you're about to say, if it's baroque, you shouldn't fix it. Um, and like the doors are like twenty five. Baroque, don't fix this. Yeah, um, you can correct me on a quote. Um, the doors are like twenty three feet high, and they look like borrowers, and it's like this massive fireplace. It's, it's utterly, utterly bizarre. Um, the Haunting of Hill Is a TV show, though, um, is a very loose adaptation of the novel mm-hmm. set in modern day, as is the the nineties version, but is much more, like it's stretched out a lot more. It's much more ad- adapted to kind of mm-hmm. what it is. And there's a new season coming out of the show, which is going to be The Haunting of Bly Manor in about three weeks, yeah. um, which I'm very much looking forward to. Because while The Haunting of Place had, an, like it, it had a very weak ending, I found. It had a very strong beginning. And the middle episode, there's one episode which it is mostly made up of three shots, was really accomplished. Mm-hmm. Uh, and The Haunting of Bly Manor, which is a sequel series, is uh, based on M.R. James' uh, The Turn of the Screw. Um, was, I called it the Timmy the Screw earlier. Oops. Did you? I didn't even hear that. Uh, the Turn of the Screw, which is, uh, we may have mentioned before, but in, have, in, in, yeah, in English literary circles, it's like A, unadaptable to a certain degree, but also X a rite of passage to have your own hot take on what it's actually about basically yeah for like a, for a novella it's one of those it's like you if you go to a, a literary library which sounds <laughs> such, like nonsense if you go to the english department the english literary department of a college library there will be like you know 20 books on ulysses 50 books on shakespeare and then for some reason 30 books on the taming of the shrew sorry and also the turn, turn, the turn of, of the screw turn of the screw oh okay but like, just like, yeah, everyone, everyone wants to write about it. Mm. Okay. Anyway, it's, it's, it was to semicolon to bring us back also to not M. More James, uh, Henry James. Am I confusing them? M. More James. Um, M. More James is ghost stories traditionally. He's ghost stories, but he's um, not American, and he's um, oh yeah, I think Henry James is American. Let me just look it up. But uh, M. More James is um, a horror writer. Henry James is the writer of uh, Portrait of a Lady. And he also wrote, wrote Tammy, the turn of the screw. You can see how I always conflate the two. One hundred percent. But M. R. James is much more. Um, yeah, he's American. He's a, M. R. James is a much more uh, niche subject. Uh, Fair. Um, but yeah, to bring us back around to Hellraiser. Um, oh yeah, it was just really good fun. I so I was I was actually kind of I was kind of fascinated with it to watch it because I approach it like just expecting like a series of horrific images yeah, rather you, than a you plot. told me that you thought at uh, two different points from the film you told me that your presumption of the film was that there was no characters and that there was no plot yeah <laughs> which I don't know what gets left but uh, it was it was a much smaller film than I anticipated so it's um, like essentially the plot of it is uh, it's, 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 it's Clive Barker's Hellraiser it's based on a, a novella called The Hellbound Heart if I remember correctly he's an English writer um, ex- gay. F- gay is filmed in England it was set in England I think in the, in the, in the marketing for the film they said it was set in America but it's clearly there's in- an odd amount of Americans or people using American accents on it yeah too. some of them were dubbed Oh, were they? Some of them were dubbed over, yeah, to it's make it more appealing bizarre. to Americans. Just oh, um, so odd. But it's a very, it's a clearly a very English production, very eighties English production. It looks like a really overrated um, version of a Doctor Who episode from the eighties. Um, and so a man is uh, finds a is basically exploring all the extremes of pleasure and pain and sensory experience you can have. Finds no more depravity on Earth, and finds this box. Um, which actually isn't named or identified in the in the film, but is later referred to as either the uh, Le Marchand's box, as the person who made the box, and the Lament, the configuration. lament configuration. Yeah. yeah. So it pulls the box, and when you solve the puzzle, it opens a dimension to where um, these otherworldly creatures, which are called Cenobites, um, live, and it's kind of this labyrinthine, uh, hell-like dimension. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Cenobites themselves are like in all leather gear. Their faces are like stretched and cut open and distorted and disfigured in different ways. And it's implied that this is all to like reach new heights of, of sensation, etc. Um, your man gets tortured, pulled apart. He manages to find his way back to the house, and over the course of the film, goes from being completely like a skeleton, basically, to being like stealing people's organs and blood, blood, and, s- yeah, blood okay. and skin and all this, and rebuilding himself while seducing his brother's wife. And a brother and a wife have moved to the house with their young daughter. And it's, that's really it. That's kind of the conflict there. But like, it all take, just really takes place in this house. There's only about six or seven characters appear in the whole thing. Um, it's all very 
unsensational in some ways while being very graphic uh, and yeah it was kind of it was a much more smaller and thoughtful thing than I was expecting I was expecting mm-hmm. like a slasher to yeah. type 5 to it and one of the reasons why the league saying about um, creature who fa- the fandom have de- deemed ping hit um, is memorable because in contrast here Jason's and your freggies he's not sarcastic and he's not like a silent like hulking monster he's kind of a thoughtful almost like aristocratic uncaring. Um, uncaring and very verbal character um, yeah so I actually thought it was, quite, it was quite quite compelling and I think for what they what they had to work with um, the horror elements and the elements of like the house shifting to allow the other dimension in and then slipping through it was actually kind of almost like labyrinth like yeah. a really fucked up version of labyrinth yeah. which, which is I yeah we definitely got, I think we both picked up labyrinth vibes from it um, specifically because of the like the puppet puppetry used There's, it's quite extensive in it um, and yeah so like like all um, oh, and also one of the um, main characters are played by Andrew Robinson who plays Garrick on Star Trek DS9 oh yeah yeah um, a character who was intended to be bisexual he played as bisexual and has since like was and has written his own novels about how he was yeah. but the, the, the production tried to downplay it the, the other thing I was going to say there about, about it is that the the oh yeah um I was looking at it afterwards. I was looking at like contemporary reviews of it, and Roger uh, Roger Ebert, who is like probably the most famous crit- film critic of all time, and um, I actually quite like his stuff. Um, his writing because he tends to be very egalitarian and very um, populist in his mm-hmm. in his approach. Um, he'd be like the film equivalent of Robert Griscow, who does a lot of music writing, where they are approaching things not from what they perceive as being um, kind of artistic but are looking at film as a medium that's to be consumed mm-hmm. and to be that you know if a, a movie can be consumed but has like weighty themes so that's like you know that's better um so but yeah he called this film depraved and i think anything that he calls depraved <laughs> i tend to like really really enjoy yeah anyway. so i i definitely recommend it. spawned by 13 sequels direct to DVD, yeah, after the stuff, fourth yeah. one, none of them in really since in cinema, which is really dark. Yeah, I think a couple of the Amiga sequels are still meant to be reasonably good, but as soon, with any horror film, as soon as you start adding space mm. and, la- and less claustrophobia, it becomes a different beast. Um, but the first, uh, first one, like a lot of uh, initial films, you're, you're alien, you're um, really Friday 13th Part 2, your Nightmare on Elm Street, etc. Worth checking out, I would say. Um, apparently the second one is like the fans consider it to be the best one so mm. I imagine it's actually just like insane so I'm, uh, I'd watch that mm. okay Buffy oh what's our, what's our, our transition speaking of um, hell gogs uh, travelling here from a different dimension that's pretty good pretty good mm. um, so in this episode of Buffy um, yeah as I think you with uh, without the editorialization quite accurately surmised there with the introduction of um Glory. The villain who I don't believe is named in the episode. I think they call, call her the Beast and that which we, we cannot name, which yeah. cannot be named or something like that. Yeah, um, which is interesting. I'll come to that in a bit. Yeah, um, and I would say overall, okay, my first uh, feelings about the episode, uh, I really enjoyed it. Me too. Um, I thought it was very economic uh, or economical in introducing the plot of the season. Just like let's just get it out there, um, because I think with both, um. With it takes, it takes season two. It's actually a, it's a long burn because it's actually a twist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and season three and four, there's a it's like a long drawn lots of out, stages. What's the plan, etc. Yeah. But this is just like essentially she's here, she wants Dong, and she's incredibly powerful. And that's I do think it, it. I think it wet, it like stretches quite thin over space of the rest of the season. Yeah. I think it like there's a point where it's like oh we know we can't defeat glory if someone could figure out how to defeat glory and etc that's 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 whatever it is that's we'll come to that when we get to it i think yeah i think you're right i think the my I, i'm not sure if i was writing this i would have dropped that information but dawn this quickly i thought that could have been probably stretched out or, or, or yeah. a few more episodes with more hinting at it and um and stuff but um it was executed really really well in this episode so the tone of the episode is that yeah Buffy is convinced that there's something magical happening with her mother's headaches um, when of course it's unfortunately just medical mm. um, when she goes looking for answers she does that very classic um, grief and kind of like you know faced with unfairness response which is that she tries to find um, like um, lightning rods for it mm-hmm. so she ends up uh, looking for a magical reason for it and she sees Dawn isn't real 
presumes that Don is uh, attacking her mother or has it appeared to yeah. to um to to affect her mother this way which to be fair reasonable yeah. reasonable and then the episode does that like a very like a little hammy but quite enjoyable thing where it then portrays Don as being actually evil where she's like mother hello I made, mother i made this tea for you would you like to drink this non-poisoned tea mm-hmm. um which is something that they did with um other xander only a couple episodes ago as yeah. well to a good effect as well yeah, yeah true 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 so um I, yeah and i think just that that like little note um the glory stuff uh, and the the magic box being the the three kind of like main threads of the episode they all really tied together nicely and they um they all actually just were tightly written well executed very enjoyable mm. so i yeah I, I thoroughly enjoyed it yeah absolutely um and i think if we look at some of those threads there like i think one of the okay the underlying really the b plot to a certain degree is a degree it's establishing the magic box as a set as a, a hq i would call it magic shop so many times and i mean magic box every time was well, it yeah yeah it's a mass, it's the magic it's a magic shop it's the mm. magic shop which is named the magic box um and giving Giles this new role as kind of proprietor and trying to um, build the place up and Anya um, seeing the value of capitalism and being very aggressive in her sales strategy and becoming part of that. And quite knowledgeable in the demonic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. She knows a lot about the actual product. Uh, and I think it's very believable. I think like a lot of shows like this will try to put their characters in kind of contrived situations that they're god they all ended up going to college together isn't that much like that kind of thing mm-hmm. um Whereas, which is nice it's a good point because like when you look at season uh three when they're trying to figure out what to do at college well it's like i'm gonna go to stay here and it's like for a specific it's, reason it, yeah. and it's not like you know oh you know i've heard that it's actually amazing you know kind of gilmore girls where they find a really contrived reason to keep bring her to yeah. to yale because yale is actually very close to uh connecticut where they're based as opposed to harvard which is very far away um the and it's like, oh, you could also visit every weekend and we can talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this one, like, and, and Willow was just like, oh, I want to be here with you because I want to, this is my purpose, etc." cetera. Yeah. And I, I think that's like a, that's a, that's a good note. It's yeah. a good, it's a good approach. And I think it comes through here as well, where it's like, there's a lot of purpose saying like Giles doesn't just want, he's not just having a midlife crisis. He wants to serve the community in some ways with knowing that the danger is out there similar to Willow and I think supplying people in this way and being a source of knowledge and all that's very, very applicable there. I think the opening of the magic box where Buffy walks in and he is wearing a wizard's hat and gown and after 30 seconds of her staring at him, he wordlessly takes it off. Is one of the saddest things I've ever seen on this program. Is it the saddest thing you've ever seen because it happens to you on like a daily basis? I empathize with it a lot. I do, I do have to say, yeah. So I don't take it off. <laughs> Just yeah, emotionally mope around in your wizard's costume. And do, do, do. What's that? It's the Charlie Brown music. <laughs> do, do, do. Yeah, okay, great. Um, yeah, so I really like that. Um, and The set has also been done up great for the mm. for the magic box. It's just like... So many... Sh- like, it's actually similar to the Hyperion Hotel and Angel. There's just so many more shooting options. And yeah. re- you can realistically have people give... Um, be uh what's the word i'm looking for off not off stage but to to the side of a scene you can break people up you can take people aside you can have people on higher levels you know there's lots going on there i think it's really it's really useful from a television point of view they've also done a really handy thing in this episode where they've shown it being a success and made that the point of the episode because um i think if they went and tried to hit the note of giles is not successful in his business and that was a note for the season i think that would be a wrong note to hit given the difficulty he had in the last season of finding a um personality yeah um <laughs> i think where... also established sorry, sorry go ahead no and and it just means that like for the rest of the season they can just have like a couple of customers in the background yeah. and it, the shop and the the economy of it be not a plot that was exactly what i was going to say yeah, yeah. so we, we see a 100 people here in the first episode so it's like just assume they're coming in in between the quiet times yeah exactly <laughs> yeah um and yeah i just love it as a base oper- operation i think it's i think it's visually sumptuous and i think it's creative i think it causes silliness and um i just find i mean you know if i got access i always like when i was younger i was like if i had access to the shop i would like poke everything you know you just like you'd pick stuff up and you'd drop it and see what happened it'd be really good fun um and yeah so i think it's a real fe- feast for the eyes it's mad that out of seven seasons of this show two of the bases of operations are people's houses yeah that's true okay um so 
this episode, Glory introduced as the big bad. Um, how do you feel about her? Yeah, I like Glory. Me too. Um, I one of the things I like most about Glory is she is very uncategorizable in terms of how she's introduced. Um, and I think that one of the because you always have like a leveling issue with heroes, you know, mm-hmm. and specifically being like, okay, well, Buffy has imbibed and uh, integrated the heart of the first Slayer, <laughs> and it, do you know what I mean? And is now being, is standing on her head and accessing her through her doing her studies. She's no longer distracted by her family. She's not distracted by um, her boyfriend. She's not distracted by her lack of interest. She's really trying to like get good at being a Slayer. Yeah. So you have to realistically you create a threat to her which is going to challenge her and i think something which is an order of power stronger than anything on earth and also something which directly threatens her family mm-hmm. like that's a great way to weaken her um so i like that i also feel that if this uh, confrontation early on between um buffy and glory is a gamble um, you have to establish Glory as like a credible threat, mm-hmm. uh, and I think they, I think they do because obviously she's just physically so much stronger than Buffy, but like so genuinely unfazed. I, I, a note I really liked in the confrontation was she only realized about halfway through the fight that Buffy was superpowers. Yeah, compared to a regular human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, because it just didn't register with her, so I thought that that was all all quite good. Yeah, I think Claire Kramer does a great job here spe- yeah. specifically. I think she she portrays Glory very very well. Um, I think she does the the kind of um, slightly off monologues very well, and she really nails the youth speak while yeah. by being this kind of camp enjoyable. Like she she's one hundred percent playing playing for the gays. Let's be realistic. Yeah. But um, I feel like when they call in that in that Buffy Ann summary where they where they refer to her being Dixie, I think that could be substituted for being a woman because like that yeah. but that's all like she's 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 conversational she's smart relaxed, she's, she's able, feminine but she's not like like i mean caring about like your shoe breaking or being like a little pissed yeah. if your shoe breaks is not the same as like like a, a, a character that intentionally harmony, harmony, exactly busy. harmony is a character who on a sleeve the the in, is intended to be if we if it's if, if it's a term why you've dixie i think i think one of the notes and harmony's like casting call or whatever it is, or like, you know, the, yeah. it would be ditzy. Yeah, because the bit is there is that despite her, her, despite her absent-mindedness, she's very effective at times in weird ways. Um, but that is not the note with Glory. She's either like mentally unbalanced because she's lost her brain glycogen or whatever, or she's perfectly competent. You know, so mm-hmm. I don't, it's a, yeah, it's not no I say at all. She, um, I think, is very notable as well in being so able for the youth speak, as we've talked about so much. She she is a reflection of Buffy mm-hmm. so deeply. She is a unburdened, um, unlocked, and unrestricted Buffy. We'll explore that more as we actually get to see who she is. But, um... Yeah, I mean, like, you know, saying that Glory is ditzy is saying that Buffy minus morality equals ditziness, which is not true. Yeah. It's actually possibly one of the reasons why Agam is ultimately a weak big bad. He doesn't reflect Buffy at all. Every hero, or not every hero, but every big bad either reflects Buffy or reflects an aspect of her. Like, even the master reflects her. her she's a vampire slayer. He is the master vampire. Like, and a, the, he, she, he, respect, he reflects her fear of death and yeah. of growing up. And yeah, there's nothing about Agam that she's afraid of, really. Mm-hmm. He's just an issue, yeah. And he's just kind of strong, yeah. Yeah. Uh, whereas the mayor, like, I think Faith is, is very clear, obviously, it's just a reflection of Buffy, but even the mayor is a, a kind of a dark reflection of her relationship with Giles and of the town that she's beholden to and all this kind of stuff, yeah. Yeah, it reflects kind of like her her rebellion against the, the kind of the patriarchy in so many ways and like the, the smooth talking patriarchy, which yeah, is yeah. The, the most insidious one. Anyway, um, Glory, great notes uh, right off the bat, um, really well executed and I just enjoy watching Claire Grammer on the screen. And very interestingly, uh, Ian Carlos Crawford, who we had a uh, but a uh, guest up, he was on mm-hmm. our podcast for an episode. And we were on his podcast for one episode, which is very nice of him. Who does Slayer Fest ninety eight? Mm-hmm. He's interviewed uh, Claire Kramer multiple times, I believe, which is like, I mean, the fucking dream. Mm. Um, did you see that she re- that uh, that Sarah Michelle Geller retweeted a co- or Instagrammed a couple of uh, Slayer Fest ninety eight stuff recently? I did. Yeah. What a moment! Imagine, imagine, ah, uh, imagine. Sarah Michelle Gellar noticed us one day. <laughs> <laughs> it could happen. Stranger things have happened. Um, I did notice as well, just in in, in related Buffyverse news, that um, Christy or is it Christy or Christy Swanson, 
Be, oh, she's a Republican. Well, Repub- not even Republican. She's like she's a, she's a Trumpist essentially. That's disgusting. Um, the the the, 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 Buffy. the the prototypical Buffy. Yeah. Um. So. So, so <laughs> I mean, okay, I was gonna make the worst, meanest joke of all time there, and I'm not gonna do it. I've held myself back. I'm sorry for thinking that even. Um, Can't wait to hear it off, Mike. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, so um, so uh, in terms of a central dynamic for the season um, or conflict. It's very, very, very straightforward. Um, Glory is here. Um, she wants to not be here to do that. She has to kill Dom. Yeah, and yeah. then there's the kind of the conflict internally in Buffy of Dawn. What does Dawn represent to her? And who is Dawn to her? And what does it kind of reflect in herself? Um, and, you know, it, it's, such an, it's such an odd season of TV in so many ways because alongside Buffy, as the audience we have to accept... We're, we're we're challenged to accept Dawn as Buffy's sister and part of her family, um, and this it's just a very odd uh, uh, pattern. Um, so what do you think? What, what what what's your like internal feelings about Dawn's introduction and the Buffy Dawn dynamic? Knowing this, so because like by the end of the episode, Buffy has accepted that like, like you know she. I think she signifies to Joyce and to Don when she comes back in from having uh, talked to this monk who she, the monk basically says, yeah, we put the key there a couple of months ago. It's all fake. And she's like, why would you put that in my house? And she's like, it's human. And she's your sister, you know? And Joyce sees uh, Buffy or Don react weirdly to Buffy when Buffy gets home because Don's quite pissed with Buffy because Buffy attacked Buffy her. Buffy fully attacked her, yeah. Yeah, really not nice. And... Don's or Don and Joyce asks what's going on, and Buffy says, "Oh, just sister stuff." Mm-hmm. Um, so she goes off. And she talks to Don, and she apologizes multiple times, and kind of like says sister stuff to her. And it's, it's it's actually very gentle, very caring, and I think it's very core to what we're going to learn in this season about Buffy, about how she's a caring person beyond being a slayer, and the slayer not being that not being. The reason she's caring. Yeah. So I think through the so the monks who are responsible for placing the key here kind of give a lot of backstory to it. And that was a very long question for me where I ended up just talking about my own feelings. Sorry. Come yeah, on. very David Norris of you. Yeah. Um they 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 they're at pains narratively to make a couple of things highly clear for the audience here. One is that Dong is fully human. Mm-hmm. She may also be the key, um, but she is a human fifteen year old girl or whatever, fourteen. Um, and also the monk is very clear she's an innocent in all of this and she knows nothing of what's happened to her and I think that's enough for Buffy mm-hmm. I think I think it's, it's, it freaks her out but um, she we've, we've said this multiple times Buffy what, what, for whatever her flaws appear to be she is a good person yep. and she sees a human person who has been put in a situation supernaturally against her will who has done nothing wrong arguably you could say it also happens to the slayer when they're called you yeah. know um, and has been is now partially associated with this thing which is not human as the slayer is and as many other you know victims of, of the supernatural kind of machinations are and how do you feel about that emotionally like are you like do you accept Dawn I do into oh, do, do, like, do I think that Dawn's her sister yeah like or do you look at this and you're like I buy the dynamics I buy the the plot contrivance that I'm being sold by the writers here. Yeah, I've actually been really sold on it, I think, so far. Um, I think I, I think the way they've handled it is quite deft because the first five, four episodes, the five, four and a half episodes, they focus just on how frustrating Dong is for Buffy. And they mm-hmm. really, they don't, they, they don't sell us on the idea of her being a sister. They show a, a sibling relationship in a way that I think is quite authentic. Mm. And Buffy is... Like Buffy's not just saying she's so frustrating because she's my sister. She actually genuinely seems pissed off. Yeah, um, and I think that that sells it quite a bit. So you can kind of see that, um, and you know it brings in questions of like identity and memory and all this. Is that if they have at the very least two months of actual memories together, but if, if nothing else, uh, they have like all these years of constructive memory. Um, how different is that really from actually caring about someone? Yeah, so I have a couple of things to say there. Yeah, you're 100% right. I think Dawn really does represent the Slayer issue, which is like, you know, becoming a po- like becoming on like a certain time in your in your life. And it's kind of like becoming an adult. Um, Dawn becomes, you know. Um, and the other thing is, I think people rarely write about Dawn um, and like constructed family. 
I think mm. people usually write about the Scoobies and how they construct a family unit around each other. I think Don is probably the the best argument for that is like found family is Don uh quite literally is constructed. Literally constructed and I think it's I think it's um I think it's something that Buffy has been working towards her whole life or her whole uh, her, the whole show so far is this idea that family isn't you know the the literal familial relations you have it's it's your friend group and it's it's it's, it's yeah. larger than that i think dawn slots in there very well in the sense i think she's been really primed to see um like yeah someone who she cares about being a, as a significant a familial relation as um her father say you know yeah and i i think dawn's presence alone kind of carries the weight of accepting that to be true because I, I often think it's quite a, it's a quite an aggressive decision the way the show doesn't show Xander's parents um, doesn't really show Willow's parents and yeah. for one episode or one two episodes um, Hank doesn't exist really either like that's egregious over seven seasons if, unless is. you're doing it deliberately yeah. so I think by having Dong here and her, her having more character uh, in five episodes than any of those other families have like that's like saying whatever you think about this they you know but so basically, we what we see in the show is Buffy's point of view, mm-hmm. and she doesn't see these other families, and she does see Don. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Um, so I wanted to say something quickly about naming conventions in this episode, and then we'll kind of move into the dusting. So, um, Ronald Wilcox in Why Buffy Matters again. Uh, I'll say the same spiel, but very good book, though I disagree with almost the entirety of it. Um, she highlights this episode. And I'm so glad she did because no one else fucking wrote even a tiny bit about this episode. Um, she says the following. Uh, in the 50s season episode, in a place like home, the Scooby gang prepare to f- face the biggest battle they've ever confronted. The one which will leave Buffy dead and buried. Spoiler alert. Um, though they came to know her, they come to know this hell god as Glory or Glorificus. Um, in this episode, they recognize her inevitable power when she they discover that she is that which cannot be named in contrast, in the same episode, when Buffy wistfully asks her mom if she ever had a nickname, her mother tells her that she was always just Buffy. The recognition of human limitation is central to the series. Um, fantasy, though it is, Buffy does not recommend unattainable transcendence, though the series recognizes the longing for it. It is not about the infinite unnameable. Mm. So, yeah, um, I just thought it was interesting that, like, you know, yeah, there is, like, it's this typical Buffy thing where it's, like, you know, small accessible communicable uh thematic stuff there where you know in an episode where Buffy's told that she's always just been Buffy to 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 Joyce and that's communicating a familial and uh sibling difficulty while also being a note of affection you have a character who's like you know cannot be named and is beyond something so Buffy being just Buffy in this episode is somewhat suggesting that she's never she's Buffy's never just a concept she's always most importantly a person you know mm-hmm. I, mean, mm-hmm. I, thought it was, I thought it was a really good note by Ronald Wilcox yeah absolutely she's Buffy first the vampire slayer very much second yeah mm-hmm. and really briefly finally um, there's a couple of we're looking at the themes of insanity and splitting uh, Spike continues his descent into um, into just madness in this episode because he's just sitting outside of uh, the Summer's household smoking tons of cigarettes and we get that really wonderful line um, that everyone wants to quote forever and ever. Five words or less Spike, why are you here? Yeah. A for a walk, bitch. (laughs) It's very Um, good. It is. And obviously uh, Glory exhibits quite a lot of uh, like a a mental imbalance when she needs to feed and she says a couple of things. One of the things she says is she um, says, or I can't remember what the line was, but she makes another Little Miss Muffet reference, which obviously is... she says um, in, in her kind of like um, like um, unbalanced monologue says something about someone sitting on a tuffet. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Which is another reference to Don. Yeah. So great. I agree. It is great. <laughs> do you want to move into the dusting, Joe? I do. Do you have any buffy bits? Yeah, so some interesting stuff about the episode. Um, one is that the um, there's not really much backstory ever given to the monks' order. Not not that it's needed, um, but they are Czech uh, mm-hmm. and they are speaking in Czech. From what we understand, um, is accurate Czech, but pronounced in a way that's very unnatural. Did you see this on the Buffy Wikipedia page? There were yes. like competing trivia points where like one person would say it's accurate, the next person would say 
well, it sounds ridiculous. The next person would say, well, it might sound ridiculous to a Czech person, but it's actually... And we're just like... Yeah, was... I love when people argue in factual sections. Yeah. Me too. Um, I also enjoy um, the uh, jo- the joke where Jobs is like, someone says, uh, check out all the magic junk. And he's like, that's our new slogan for the store. That was yeah. good. I would 100% use that for my magic store. Um, and some, just some weird plotting notes as well. So Riley and Willow arrive to the magic box together. Um, which they would just never travel together or have a conversation, which was bizarre. And then fundamentally, one of the plot of this episode is, um, one of the plot points of this episode is that Buffy is using a spell, an old spell, a trance, to um, allow you to see the signature of a spell. So you can see an imprint or residue of where a spell has been used. A, incredibly useful, should come up again. B, why is Buffy doing it by herself? Why not Willow and Tara? There's, there's no reason why they couldn't do it. It's magic, as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I, it seems to be a matter of convenience because it's in Buffy's house, but like, when has that ever mattered? I just thought that was really odd. Riley refers to the training uh, space in the magic box as the danger room, which can only be an X-Men reference. Well, I, thought, yeah. I thought you'd appreciate that. Uh, and then just a, a couple of weird notes. One was uh, when... Don asked Buffy what she's doing in her room and she's like, my boyfriend, go away. I was like, Jesus Christ, don't say that, yeah? Yeah, what the fuck? Um, and, uh, Spike, Spike saying to Buffy that uh, she has stupid hair. <laughs> it's quite funny. This is also one of only three times on the televisual program that they she calls him William. Yes, yeah, I saw that too. Okay, um, yeah, I have a couple of things for you too. Um, I saw a note which was saying, suggesting that uh, Ben shouldn't be able to be in the hospital at this point because Gory was still trapped, and I wasn't sure about that. Um, I don't think she's trapped for anything more than a couple of minutes. Mm. Did you notice that in the magazine that Joyce is reading, there's actually an ad featuring Sarah Michelle Gellar? Oh, very good. Yeah, which is quite funny. And, oh yeah, and the other note I had was just I thought that Glory actually came across quite villain esque from mm. Killing Eve. Um, anyway... Should we look at some fashion then? Absolutely. So, very notable in this episode, fashion-wise, has to be Glory's um, red dress, red dress and, and heels, heels and yeah. fantastic hair and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, total, like, I mean... She's, total she's, smoke she's, show. She's all American, and she, uh, she at one point, uh, when they're talking Czech, she's like, um, speak American. And yeah, I think there's no phrase in the world that, like, can rile up a person worse than speak American. Yeah, yeah. American's not a fucking language. Anyway, um, so it's a very deliberate point as well. It is, yeah. it is, yeah. Um, Don and Buffy at the beginning of the episode are both wearing weird dangly necklaces and I thought it was an odd choice. Um, I thought Sarah Michelle Gellar looked genuinely angelic in this episode. Mm. Her hair is lovely. She's, she just, she, she's dressed in lots of muted, um, like kind of beige clothes and she just looks lovely. Ben's haircut is it's just, just so bad. It's the worst. Why anyone would ever decide to wear that haircut is very confusing. Um, Anya is wearing a leopard print kimono in this episode. As you do. Yep. And I think we have to highlight again in this episode that Giles does wear a, a wizard <clears throat> a wizard's uh, clothes because I think we're going to want to remember that when we are looking at the best and worst uh, outfits of the season. That's, 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 that is true. That is true. So for, any other? for best, I presume, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Do you have any other fashion notes? Fashion notes? Um, I think that the outfits that the monk wears um, are terrible and the haircuts are terrible and they look ridiculous and they look like party city outfits whenever they do that kind of stuff. And uh, They do a lot on angels as well. They're cultists and they just look mm-hmm. silly. Um, and otherwise, yeah, I think Dong is still dressed in very church lady in this episode. Yeah. I think she needs to needs to use it up a little bit. And she then says to uh, Buffy that she, she has an awful sense of fashion. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so how about the rating? No, oh, sorry, death count. Do you have a death count? Yeah, absolutely. You lied. Oh, you meant now. Mm. So yeah, four decks overall. The three monks of the Order of the Key killed by Glory, two off screen and one tortured, uh, in a and dies in a clip, which will be shown at the preview of every episode for the next for the rest of the season. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one vampire staked by Buffy in the opening scene as well. Very good. Okay, and what is your rating? Gosh, I would probably give this eight point three bags of ground up cloven hooves. Lovely. Um, tell me about that. So that was a really good episode. I I I've, I feel like I would be a little bit tired to have done another season of like spent the whole season figuring out what's happening. So I think that's smart writing. I think I think there's a lot of challenges in season five, um, which they're really tackling very well. Um, and I think everyone pulled a blinder. I think everyone 
portrayed the role really well and I'm kind of excited to check out the viewer to see what happens next yeah um, I'm going to give it 8.4 uh, birthings out of 10 uh, I think I just, this is the closest we've been in a while yeah it is well I think we got the same one last week mm. but um, we yeah I just, I just I just like it I like Laurie I like the gang dynamics in season 5 um, yeah I just really like it and you know what's the next episode anyway, it's family oh very good yeah which I think is the first episode of Buffy I ever saw Really? Mm. That's exciting. What mm. made you watch it? It was on TV. And you're just like, let's check out this. It was after swimming one day in my granny's house. Yeah. Okay. Exciting. Yep. Um, okay. So, the Cordelia Chase. What was this episode called? Dear Boy. What was it about again? Uh, so, essentially, this is culminating some of the Darla stuff. Yes. Um, so, Darla has been progressively harassing Angel through his dreams and has now escalated to um, essentially being uh, seen in person by him um, and her whole end game is to um, for, from well from Harris point of view is to disturb him and rile him up and unbalance him to the point where he turns evil not to be killed but to come over to their side of the prophecy um, and she's kind of going along with that but she really just wants them to be together again and for them to be evil again etc and um, so I thought it was quite a good episode I think um, part of what they're doing with Angel is distancing him from his support network and um, making him seem more unstable um to the extent where by the the arc for the end of the season will be that he's gonna fire the angel the, the crew and kind of go dark uh, and kill a lot of the wolf from harsh well allow them to be killed I, he's directly responsible for them being killed as far as i'm concerned maybe we'll talk about that um and there is a nice little mystery because there's a, a section of the episode where he does see her and find her and she maintains really aggressively that she's no idea who she is, who he is. And he sees her walk into sunlight and she's clearly human, which is a reveal because up until now we assume she's actually been shot and portrayed very vampirically. Um, and yeah, and basically the gang are worried about him. Gung finds out that he is has the capacity to turn evil, which he wasn't aware of. So there's all this instability there. He's getting quite aggressive with them. And there's a lot of flashbacks to... Um, Ireland. To Ireland, to how they were together originally. Galway. Galway. And one of the reveals there being that um, they show the circumstances uh, from another angle that led to Drusilla's siring mm. and how Drusilla is kind of a, a testament to Angelus's kind of eternal malice, really. Um, and I don't know why it never occurs to me when I, it's, it was the same thing with Darla and same thing with Drusilla. When you see these actors in flashbacks, they're not just there for the flashback, you know. So it is leading up to Drusilla being reintroduced in this yeah. season. Um, but this is the first time we see Drew since she leaves Buffy at the end of um, season two I want to say and season two I think she was in another episode but yeah go on um, but it's actually been a while so it actually is when, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing these guys all the time but when she turns around in this episode it's like oh my god Drusilla's here yeah, yeah that's so great there's, great. A bit, there's a bit of that and um, there's a lot of very aggressive uh, angels singing karaoke again which they're really really kind of overplaying by this point but I still enjoy it um, and uh, you know, some stuff around Kate Lockley kind of increasingly distrusting him and she pulls a SWAT team on the hotel uh, and what might be their only interaction with uh, between her and Gon she racially profiles him she racially profiles him pretty badly and she just she's like oh you know I was a somewhat likable detective yeah, character really, it's like no a little bit here, yeah. no I mean we know what all cops are yeah but um, overall kind of a, a, an interesting adventure I think um, they've they're building up a relationship between Darla and Angel and a texture to that relationship which is different to what it was on Buffy um, and different to what it has been so far to make it worthwhile I think it is it is, it is compelling so mm-hmm. I, mean, I enjoy it overall I'd probably give it maybe um, seven fair famous gestures yeah it's going to go the same yeah. it was it was, it was was bringing things along I, nothing offensive about it um, I still think that the dynam- dynamics especially in the core crew are just like lacking mm. they need something to pull it together they need they need gun to be better written yeah and to have a personality and um, beyond like being stand- standoffish initially in interactions um like he has no interests you know yeah what's yeah. what's good interest in um uh an axe make of a hope cap yeah anyway okay um that's us for this week i i think yeah i think so too great um, okay, well, thanks very much for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, tell your friends and tell your uh, manifestations of a hell god. Mm-hmm. Uh, and be safe, be well, and we'll see you next time. Where is it going to be, Ryan? Bye, boys. By the way, if you 
listen to us talk about Lovecraft Country, Lovecraft Country a couple of weeks ago, and you're like, oh, maybe I will check that out, maybe I won't. It's only gotten better and better, and they're doing this amazing thing where every episode is like a new genre, and this week was um, like full-on just uh, adventure novels uh, most po- popularly portrayed through like the indiana jones indiana jones it was 100 yeah. percent just indiana jones but it could it be alan, um, Therese. alan quarterman quartermaster or not sorry alan quartermain or yeah. any of that kind of stuff you know but, um, the center of the earth get there. on that band get on that get on that bandwagon it's, it's, it's compelling it's so good and speaking of smoke shows yeah okay um yeah next time buffy boys see you slon